Thank you, David, for that kind introduction. My understanding of the remit of uh, these talks is that they are supposed to be not for the experts in the audience who should leave as soon as it's decent, but for the non-experts. It's a survey I've um, prepared of the really an answer to the question, why should you ever think there was a connection between black holes on the one hand and information on the other? And as we go through the reasons for that, uh, we will touch upon the sorts of topics and questions which this program uh, is uh, aiming to address. It's a great pleasure to be speaking here on this topic. I attended, I think, the second of the programs at this institute when it was under the directorship of Walter Cohn back in 1980. And um, I have to confess that many of the things that we've been talking about uh, have a certain uh, resonance uh, <laughs> with those in, in those days. But uh, another constant uh, has been the weather. It was extraordinarily wet that spring because of an El Nino event which sort of washed down the canyons and uh, it seems to have been quite wet at least over the weekend. That having been said, let me give you a rough plan. I don't know when I'll get through all of this. My aim is that the non-experts should know roughly what the basic ideas are in the subject. Um, perhaps remember the odd formula, although we won't be doing um, any derivations. And it, uh, to, to understand anything, you need to understand uh, classical black holes, but in particular, the many analogues which were found in the past with thermodynamics. <coughs> However, uh, in order to make progress and in order to understand uh, what's going on uh, and how this analogy can be made more concrete, we have to pass from the classical to the quantum. Uh, and uh, historically, at least, that passage was done via semi-classics by considering fixed backgrounds and thinking of quantum fields propagating around them. And uh, the basic message here is that the classical analogues at the level that we study them become identities that there are very, very strong reasons for believing that black holes behave just like regular thermodynamic systems. Well, this is because of a phenomenon known as Hawking evaporation. And uh, it involves such topics as black hole remnants, and uh, quantum entanglement. So I'll mention a few ideas or aspects of this. Now at that time, ideas about quantum gravity were rather imprecise. People had begun to calculate one loop corrections. Um, in pure gravity, we knew that one loop corrections to Einstein's theory were harmless. Um, but um, there was a great deal of enthusiasm for uh, supergravity as a possible way of taming those divergences. And what is striking, at least to me, is that black holes and supergravity fit like a hand in a glove. There are some beautiful aspects of uh, the general theory of supersystems which apply absolutely on the nose to the theory of classical black holes. And uh, this goes under the name of uh, BPS, or extreme black holes. <coughs> and uh, two uh, phrases should be borne in mind in this uh, concept. If you know anything about algebra, and in particular super algebras, 
a key idea is the idea of a central charge, a very mysterious object, and uh, a historical reference back to uh, Johnny Wheeler. For those that have read his books and papers, you've been thinking <coughs> charge without charge. Flux lines trapped in the topology of space uh, was how he thought about this. <coughs> so uh, there are some, uh, you can make a great deal of progress at this sort of level, but um, eventually most people decided that pure supergravity theories are not the route to quantum gravity, or rather they are a route, but it's not the final stage. We have to go beyond that. And uh, for many people, going beyond that means going to string theory. Now, um, I'm not necessarily saying string theory is uh, the only answer, and it's certainly in its present form not the final answer, but it is an extremely promising area. And on the basis of that, of course, people have convinced themselves that we in principle have a perturbative quantum theory of gravity. But that perturbative expansion is not sufficient to grasp the full depth of the theory. And uh, what comes into that theory are non-perturbative excitations. And uh, those excitations in general are known as brains. And it turns out that brains and black holes are very closely related. And moreover, given that fact, it's been possible to count the number of states associated with uh, macroscopic black holes, mainly of the BPS type, and uh, that agrees with the thermodynamic properties which I'm about to explain found uh, classically. So I'll be talking about brains and black holes. <coughs> And the, uh, the word here is mi excuse me, microstate counting. Now, brains have nice, uh, have interesting properties. They behave a bit like black holes uh, near black hole near the horizon of these. BPS black holes, things look very much like anti Dositta space, and uh, this has led to the idea that uh, we can, or that there exists a certain correspondence to the number of people, but principally Maldacena is the one who's developed it most, that there is something called the ADS CFT correspondence, and this is uh, related to the notion of holography the notion that degrees of freedom or information, I'm using these in an extremely vague way, these words, uh, reside not in the bulk of some system but on its boundary. So uh, this has also reinforced our conviction that uh, there is a deep connection Uh, between uh, ideas of holography and ideas of black holes. We could say that the original suggestion came from this direction. And then finally, I want to say a bit about, so ADS stands for anti de Sitter. That's a space-time with a cosmological constant which is negative. But all of this is all very theoretical. I want finally at the end of the talk to discuss the real application of these ideas to the origin and nature of the universe. And to do that I have to switch signs. I want to be talking about the Sitter horizons and uh, the topic of inflation. Well, that's the menu. How far I get, I'm not too sure. Um, it's quite ambitious, obviously, so I won't be able to say too much. I want just to convey the buzzwords and the, and the simple ideas uh, so that uh, 
you see there's something in what we're trying to say. Now, let's start with topic one, which is gravitational collapse and the theory of black holes. The black holes goes back quite a way. The first paper on this was written in uh, 1784. If you want to look it up, you can go to NASA ADS and type in the name Mitchell and the date 1784 and it'll come up and you can read it. It's a fantastic paper in which using the ballistic theory of light, uh, Mitchell, after conversations with uh, Cavendish, decided that, or, or realized that, uh, if an object of mass M was compressed within a radius, I'm using high precision here, including the number, but given by that formula, uh, then light can't escape from it. Such an object would have a gravitational field, which you can easily estimate, I'm going to call that kappa, not little g, uh, to be, um, well, it's gm over r squared, so if r is given by that, it's going to be uh, uh, c to the fourth divide 4 gm. So these formulae are all you need to know, really, about black holes. They have a size given by radius, which you could estimate from Newtonian theory, and turns out to be the exact result. And they have in their neighborhood uh, the va local value of the gravitational acceleration, and it's given by this formula. And uh, of course, these are deduced from an inconsistent theory of gravity, but uh, because the theory of light and gravity uh, was not satisfactory at that time. These ideas were completely forgotten after Thomas Young had revived uh, and vindicated Huygens' wave theory of light. So we had to wait until general relativity, which is our best consistent theory of the interactions of light and gravity before they were incorporated. But even then it took a long time. It wasn't until the early 70s that what we now think of as the standard picture, uh, the, uh, synthesis, uh, the modern synthesis, that uh, uh, gravitational collapse and black holes were properly understood. And uh, the key concept that was needed here is the idea of an event horizon. So I want to draw a diagram to illustrate this. And this diagram is uh, probably the most important thing that you have to remember apart from the formulae. You can work out the formulae, of course, very easily. We're going to consider a star which uh, begins in a static state, runs out of nuclear fuel, and uh, begins to collapse inwards. And for certain masses, masses bigger than, for example, the Chandrasekhar limit or some very large uh, perturbation uh, in the center of a galaxy, uh, there will be nothing that can stop it from falling inwards classically and forming a singularity. Now as it does so, we're going to ask what happens to uh, light as it escapes or begins to escape from the stars because um, what we're going to be looking at, the event horizon, is, should be thought of as the last wave front to escape. <coughs> Note, I'm already considering a time-dependent situation, which it's very important to bear in mind when thinking about these things. So the basic idea is that uh, if you consider a light a flash of light moving outwards at early times, let's put it in orange, it escapes. Excuse me, that's meant to escape. <laughs> um, but if you think of it at late times, it gets bent and it fails to escape. All of these are uh, light-like surfaces.
So, of course, you expect that there will be an intermediate situation, and the intermediate situation will look something like this. So here it's stationary, and actually I'm going to color code it. I'll put a green, I guess, if I can remember. So that's a stationary wave front. And it is the event horizon. So uh, inside here, you can't get out classically because you'd have to travel faster than light. That's the basic, simple concept. All that <coughs> a star. Now the radius is given by this formula, and uh, outside here, there's a measure of the gravity. This is sort of slightly renormalized notion of gravity, but it's the one that's relevant. And um, what you also observe is that um, <coughs> at least it's plausible from the picture. that you can think of a cross-section of this wave front. In the spherical case, that's an expanding sphere. And it's pretty clear that it's increasing. And indeed, that's the general um, property. final is bigger at least, but most equal to A initial. So that's if you like A final, that's A initial. And it's a monotonic process. The reason for that is each of these, uh, if, if you just consider the rays associated with this, a bunch of rays and they're getting converged by gravity. Now if they actually are converging, because energy is always positive, they'll always converge. That's a simple result. So they cannot be converging in order to get out to infinity. They must be diverging. But if they're diverging, then the area has got to increase. So inevitably, there is a non-decreasing function associated with gravitational collapse. Now, this thing is supposed to settle down to a final state, and uh, calculations show there are such final states. These final states are independent of time, and they are stable. So there's a final equilibrium, and uh, something called the no-hair theorem. which in four dimensions is a rigorous theorem. Final state <coughs> depends on just, uh, well, I'll call it three. You could make it four, depending on your theory. I'll explain that in a moment. Three quantities. The mass or energy of the system is angular momentum because we could make the whole thing spin. And one or more charges. Let's suppose we just have a theory with electric charges. We can add in magnetic charges, and you can think of hypothetical theories with lots of charges. So just three numbers characterize whatever you started from. So what we're finding is that there is a distinguished, unique final state parameterized by just three numbers. And during the process, something increases with time. I should say these parameters are subject to an inequality, which I'll write down. Well, in the units I'm using. It's a rather strange formula, but it's what it is.
So you get to pick them as long as they satisfy this inequality. And black holes which are on the boundary of this inequality are called extreme. Now, toward each of these black holes, you can associate a radius, the formula is a bit more complicated, and a surface gravity. I won't give you the formula, but the key point about that is that the surface gravity is zero for the extreme case. What's happening here is, if the thing is rotating, centrifugal forces overwhelm gravity, you just can't have a black hole. If you put charge in, the ordinary repulsive effects overwhelm gravity, you can't have a black hole. So there's a boundary between the objects which are black holes and which are not. And those are the ones that are uh, associated with this BPS condition when we pass to supergravity. Okay, now, these horizons are fairly tricky things, and so here is the thing I want to say to the experts, though they will know it. In order to define this horizon, you need to know what happens for all of time. They are highly non-local. <coughs> They're tricky in that respect. You can't put your finger on a horizon. We may ourselves be inside one at this moment. We would never know. So they're an artificial construct. Another way to say it is, if you believe in Hamiltonian mechanics, you'll have a hard time dealing with horizons because they're not easily described if you have a uniform flow of time. From the point of view of Lagrangian physics, it's not a problem because in Lagrangian physics, we look at the entire evolution of our system. And so you just ask that you want light rays satisfying a teleological boundary condition. That is not what we normally do in all our other areas of, of physics. They're tricky also for another reason, which I want to show you, and that's this. Supposing, I've got to draw another diagram, so I'll do it here. Supposing you have a black hole, or sorry, a collapsing star, and it collapses. Okay, so you begin to get what you think is a horizon, and so you say, well, there's a black hole. <coughs> is that really true? Well, the answer is no, because at any moment, you could throw in some more matter. If you did that, this would start to converge. Remember, it's on the boundary between converging and diverging. Any positive energy causes it to focus. So this guy has to hurtle into here. What that means is the true horizon is nowhere where you thought it was. It had to start earlier and be over here. So the horizon, if you think of it as evolving in time, jumps around in a crazy way. You can't keep track of it locally, even classically. This is not a problem of quantum mechanics, but obviously even more puzzling in quantum mechanics. So this is a non-local object. In fact, it's teleological. Now, in quantum gravity, things get even worse. Because in quantum gravity, there are no local observables at all. So you're going to have find an even more difficult time in describing this in a local fashion. The only observables in quantum gravity are global, because we're always allowed to do diffeomorphisms. That's a separate thing from this. This is just because you've defined a thing to be highly non-local. OK, so now we're beginning to see that uh, this thing has the smell of thermodynamics. Um, let me say a few more things. So this area, which is a complicated formula in general, it's convenient to introduce something called an irreducible mass concept used by Demetrius Christodoulou. If we had a Schwarzschild black hole, that would be the regular mass. Now, this guy is not going to decrease uh, with time. That's the consequence of this theorem proved by Stephen Hawking. So uh, it 
it's it's an irreducible mass, and I want you to bear in, uh, think about the formula in special relativity, where in classical relativity, without decay, particle decays, we have a formula which says that the mass is equal to uh, the irreducible bit known as the rest mass plus a piece which is kinetic. This is extractable, this is not, classically. Of course, if you make the thing decay and do other things, it's a slightly different story. We can break up the mass of our black hole into similar contributions. There's a formula whose precise nature isn't important, but I'd like to write it down just to make this clear that it's very concrete. So the energy available to us, free energy if you like, is composed of energy we can't do anything about, plus electrostatic potential energy, which we could extract by putting in charges or making the electric field do some work, and rotational kinetic energy, which is the analog of this guy. So this is a very close analogy with thinking about the free energy of a system. And now you see this irreducible is like something which is not uh, decreasing. In fact, we will later be saying that this is up to a factor four or so, the entropy of our system. So this is like expressing the energy as a function of entropy, which can only increase and adiabatically remains constant, plus other contributions. Now that formula can be differentiated and you get the last item in the classical theory of black holes. which is the first law. We find that if you were to change the parameters of a stable final state, then you get a formula of the following sort. This is the electrostatic potential of the black hole. I won't give the formula. This is the electrostatic work done when you change the parameter, or obtained when you change the parameters. This is the angular velocity, so this is the kinetic energy term, which occurs in every thermodynamic system. And by golly, what's this? Well, it sort of looks like TDS. It has all of the classical properties of an entropic system. And the question is, what is S and what is T? Well, one guess would be that S is some function of A, monotonic increasing. And T, therefore, is some function of kappa. But, of course, you have to adjust it. Because as you all know, in thermodynamics, the notion, if you just have an expression like TDS, you need a temperature scale to measure T, or alternatively, an entropy unit to measure entropy. It's not defined simply by saying that that's positive. In ordinary thermodynamics, we use an, we use a, an ideal gas. That's the usual definition in the undergraduate books. We couple the system to something we know about, and that determines what the precise formula is. So how can we do this? Uh, in our case. Well, we don't really want an ideal gas because that's classical, but we can choose something quantum mechanical. We couple to a quantum field. <coughs> so that leads me to the semi-classics uh, of these uh, objects. Um, Thank you. 
So what we do is we consider a quantum field on this background. We assume that this is a background which is given to us. This is physically inconsistent, as we shall see, but it's the first stage of an, approxima of an approximation procedure. We imagine, let us say, photons, quantized photons moving on this background. And we say, well, what would happen if we had initially some vacuum state? <coughs> so there's nothing there at all. Now, in the vacuum, we always have the production of pairs. Even photon pairs get produced out of the vacuum. And so uh, you could expect a process of this sort. Let's suppose, perhaps they're not photons, but particles, so you can really think of them as uh, electrons, for example, with, a, with an arrow. Now, this is an almost perfect absorber, classically. So there's a good chance that this particle can fall in and this particle can escape. And that's what uh, was found in a, a beautiful calculation by Hawking. So here we get quantum mechanical. The in vacuum is, can be expressed in terms of two other vacua. The space of states which go out and the space of states which go in. And in general, that will be um, a complicated sum. It'll be a tensor product, or sum of tensor products of outgoing states with ingoing states. And they'll be inextricably entangled. Well, this is an entangled state. Now, what do we do with such a state? If we are interested in making measurements at large distances away from the hole, we'll have to trace over the states we don't observe. And so, as in all areas of quantum mechanics, we'll get a partial density matrix. So tracing is partial density matrix. In order to calculate that, what we have to bear in mind is the process of particle creation is really changing a basis in your space of uh, states. It's very analogous to choosing different quasi-particle uh, states in a solid state system, for example, or condensed matter system. You have to compute what are called Bogolubov coefficients. You have to say, suppose I have a positive frequency wave here, which is going to be one of the elements of my ingoing state. I, uh, pass it up to, I, 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 I pass it up to infinity and I see uh, what, it, what composition it has. Because of the time dependence in general, it will be a combination of positive and negative frequencies. That's why I insist on the time dependence. You can't understand what's going on unless you really think of time dependent systems. Now, the particles that get out to infinity at late times hover for a long time here. Their, in, their, their, their red shifts are very large. In fact, that's a, a, a technical problem with this way of proceeding, which I will explain shortly. So, um, in general, you do this classical calculation, uh, taking into account that red shift. I won't do it on the board. And, uh, and that will tell you what the elements of this density matrix are. So, in the approximation we are dealing with, this gives a Gibbs, Gibbsian density matrix. In other words, it's a thermal density matrix associated with the outgoing states. And uh, associated with that is a temperature. And here is the magic formula. Kt is given by all black holes that we know about 
uh, eight bar kappa over two pi c. So the surface gravity determines uh, the, um, the temperature. In fact, there's an analog of this statement in ordinary flat space. If you consider an accelerated observer, then actually if you decompose the uh, Minkowski vacuum state in this way, you'll see that the observer will see a distribution of particles with uh, so-called under temperature given by the acceleration. This is just the acceleration. They're locally, uh, or semi-locally, more or less the same. Now, thing. now, if you actually translate this for the ordinary spherically symmetric black holes, you get a formula, which is like this. Uh, now, the, um, so we've now actually fixed what the temperature is. And since the temperature is proportional to kappa, we've now also fixed what the entropy is. So the final part of this way of thinking about the connection between black holes is that the black hole entropy has to be, be consistent at the large semi-classical level given by this formula. Now this formula has, uh, can be reinterpreted in a simple way. Uh, the Planck length, which we haven't used so far, is given by h bar g over c cubed to the one half. The Planck length is the Compton wavelength of, uh, well, if you think of an object whose Schwarzschild radius equals its Compton wavelength, that for a factor two, uh, then that object will have the Planck mass and will have uh, the Planck scale. So if we reorganize this uh, formula here, left out of four, what we actually get is that this is Boltzmann's constant A over four LP squared. And this is the beginning of speculations about holography. They go back a long way. Uh, even in the 70s, people were talking about this sort of idea. You see, um, we are trying to think of this formula as in some sense related to the kind of formula we would normally use. For example, we might be tempted to use Boltzmann's formula. Actually, it's not really Boltzmann. Uh, it's probably Planck, which associates uh, entropy with the number of states of a system at fixed energy. So this formula should be thought of as the entropy is a function of the charges and the mass and the angular momentum. So uh, Boltzmann, of course, was a classical man, but this, the quantum mechanical equivalent of Boltzmann's statement is that. So that makes a certain sort of sense because of the following geometrical picture. Here's our horizon, thought of as a sphere. We're looking, we're cutting it at one time, and then we just break it up into little regions, just as we do with a map of the world. If those regions are of length LP, then the number of those regions is just given by A over LP squared up to a factor of pi or so. So if we can, in that small little um, volume there, or area there, if we, if we can lose an amount of information of one bit, or if we can encode the amount of information one bit, in terms of orders of magnitude, this is an explanation for the funny formula. So, in other words, at the semi-classical level, we can argue that the entropy of this black hole is some measure of the in quotes information, because I didn't define it, lost uh, during the collapse and then liberated later. Now the final step in this chain of arguments, so I've not put anybody's names to these chain of arguments, they're now classic, you can look them up in the literature. The last chain of uh, steps in these semi-classical arguments are, um, is the generalized 
second law. Okay, so obviously, as you put stuff into this black hole, this could have some entropy. Almost certainly what if it were a star? And it's lost to the outside world, in some sense. But we don't like losing entropy because we think there ought to be a compensating effect and that the second law of thermodynamics should hold for everybody. If that is true, well, this area increase should compensate the entropy decrease. Moreover, as this black hole evolves, I haven't spoken of its evo evolution, it's, if it's going to emit particles, it's going to lose energy, its area will go down, but particles in, thermal, uh, in a thermal state will be liberated. So again, you can hope that the total entropy is uh, certainly non-decreasing. And so the generalized uh, second law would be that the entropy of black holes plus the entropy of matter uh, is non-decreasing. Okay. Now, I haven't spoken much about taking this procedure beyond this level, but I want to say a few words about that and what it leads to before we get on to the BPS states. So I'm running quite tightly, but I think I have at least five minutes beyond because I started slightly, slightly late. Okay, now you will see from these formulae that the temperature of our black hole is inversely as the mass. That means that as you decrease the mass, the temperature goes up as it loses energy, and that means the specific heat is negative. That's a very strange phenomenon, but it's universal. Any gravitating system for which gravity dominates will have that property. That's what makes the stars shine, and that's what makes the world go around. So it's an inevitable consequence of gravity. It's true for these black holes with, um, without charges. It ceases to be true when we're near extremality, and I will come back to that uh, in a moment. Now, um, the other... So the uh, normal expectation of what will happen in this case is that if there is nothing outside to prevent it, a black hole will ultimately radiate all of its energy away, or at least it will decrease its size over the regime in which this is a good approximation. Who knows what happens towards the end when it will get very small. That's an explosive um, process. The only thing that can stop it is to put a box around the outside and confine the radiation. And then you can begin to investigate what that would mean in terms of uh, an equilibrium between uh, the outgoing radiation uh, and, and the black hole itself. If you can construct a model in which there is such an equilibrium, then you will have measured the temperature in the same way that in the lab you'd measure the temperature by coupling a system to an ideal gas or some thermometer whose properties you knew about. Now that turns out to be... Um, uh, very straightforward. So, so far I have uh, not done anything about quantizing gravity, um, but we can begin to see what quantizing gravity uh, would uh, introduce, what changes would be introduced uh, if we did, by looking at a path integral quantization, if you like. We will say that semi-classically the um, Partition function, which is something that we'd be interested in computing, is some sort of path integral over metrics. Now, in thermodynamics, it's well known that the path integral over, for, sorry, the partition function for a ordinary thermodynamic system at temperature T is given by a path integral, if you choose to use path integral methods, over trajectories, histories, which are periodic in the inverse of the temperature. Uh, that just comes because you take the trace of e to the minus beta h, you think of e to the minus beta h as moving you forward in imaginary time, and since it's a trace, it's a cyclic process, and so all path integrals in ordinary thermodynamics can be thought in that way. 
And in quantum field theory, you do the same thing. Quantum field theory can be thought of as a special case of thermodynamics, except the fields live on four-dimensional Euclidean space. And when you work out the partition function, it's just as if you were working out the zero temperature generating function. Or so. If you want to do it at finite temperature, you don't work on Euclidean space, you work on three-dimensional Euclidean space and a circle for time, and then you decompose into the Matsubara frequencies. <coughs> so we can do exactly the same thing in black hole physics, and um, we consider some box. It's an artificial box which doesn't let things like gravitons out. We consider a black hole, and uh, then we consider the equilibrium. Now, um, there are different ways of doing this, but one way which is relevant for what I'm going to say later is that, um, that this box had radius RB. Uh, we can look... Well, first of all, I should say that we will represent this by a Euclidean path integral. That's one way that you can proceed. And if you do so, uh, you will find that the, the, there is uh, a Euclidean version of the Schwarzschild solution, which is periodic in imaginary time. I don't have time to explain that in great detail, except to say that the period agrees with precisely 1 over kT that you'd expect from thermodynamics, where the T is given by the formulae uh, that I've written down. So when you do that, um, you find that... Um, uh, there are various uh, instantons in this uh, theory, or there, there may or may not be an instanton in this theory. You try to match uh, this system uh, to, uh, you have a boundary here, you have a boundary which is the circle of, of temperature times, let's say, S2. You try to put in a black hole, you find that you may or may not be able to match those two. <coughs> Um, you find that uh, if the parameters are such that uh, R is bigger than 3 gm over c squared, there are two ways of matching. There's an unstable and a stable black hole. And if R is less than 3 gm over c squared, then there is no black hole. So what's going on here is if you have a small system where the black hole has to be very small, very hot, it evaporates very quickly. It can't be in equilibrium with radiation. If you have a big system, uh, then uh, the black hole can be very big and very cool, and so can the radiation, and so there can be an equilibrium. In other words, there's a phase transition in the system. So you can draw some diagram like that, and um, the, uh, have the formula for this is given by uh, KTR is H bar, in this case, C over 8 pi root 27. Now, I've mentioned this because uh, this sort of calculation, these sort of calculations are down in the mid-80s, uh, well, a bit earlier than that, but then through the mid-80s. They actually form an, a central part of our understanding of confinement according to the ADS-CFT correspondence because uh, many years later, uh, replacing this rather primitive box by an ADS space, I'll say a bit more about that later, uh, an ADS space behaves like a big box. You do the same calculation. Now, according to um, Maldacena's ideas, the boundary theory you're describing is Yang-Mills uh, on the boundary. You know that at high temperature, you should be looking for Deconfinement, there is a phase transition, and that's the phase transition that you get. I'll flesh that out later, but just to say that all of these ideas worked out in the past have come to uh, a strange, um, uh, have come to great, great fruition. So this is all part of the evidence that there's something seriously going on here, uh, that the physics is a principle understood, but it's not to say there aren't many deep questions about how you implement these things. Uh, in detail. As I said earlier, um, we don't have a proper quantum theory of gravity without introducing strings. If we introduce strings, we have to go to non perturbative degrees of freedom, etc., etc. And uh, we don't really have a guarantee that much of this makes sense. So 
the aim of many people over the years has been to try and flesh this out with more and more reliable quantum theories of gravity. And the first reliable quantum theory of gravity, putatively, was uh, supergravity. So I want to say a bit about BPS uh, black holes. <coughs> Now the sound bite for this is uh, the following. Supersymmetry is a theory where the Hamiltonian is quadratic in some fermionic generators called supersymmetry generators, but possibly there's some extra term. This term commutes with everybody. That's, uh, so it's certainly in the centre of the supersymmetry algebra. But what it actually means physically is that you can't change the value of this term. So it can't be like an angular momentum and it can't be by, uh, like an electric charge. It's, uh, it's called a central charge. And uh, in fact in black holes it's a very familiar concept. You see, if you look at these supergravity theories, take the simplest one, which would be Einstein-Maxwell theory, with a bunch, with two uh, Majorana fermions. To say that the fermions are Majorana is to say they carry no electric charge. The graviton certainly carries no electric charge, and since it's an abelian theory, the photon carries no electric charge. So if it happened that there was some flux coming out of a black hole, it could only be for topological reasons, and only because it was put there either from the very beginning or maybe by some tunneling process. And if you have that charge, then the only thing that can happen to the black hole is as it evolves, let's take the lid off the box and let it evolve, the, the uh, photons in that theory, thermal photons and thermal gravitons will be emitted, reducing the mass, but they cannot, according to these formulae, reduce it to anything below the value where we put the J to zero because you can radiate J, J is not a central charge, you'll be down to an, an interesting situation where uh, you have uh, M is equal to um, Q over root G, so called extreme black holes. So it's a particular manifestation of a very general phenomenon. The extreme Rice and Nordstrom black holes are these BPS states. What's exciting about the BPS states is that there are many, many arguments saying that quantum corrections to BPS states are very small, if non-existent. There are non-renormalization theorems or non-renormalization arguments. So there's an enormous uh, advantage in focusing on these states because they, we can reliably calculate with them. So uh, that's the next step in the argument. I haven't got too long to go, so I'll now talk about brains. Now the concept of a brain is a very simple idea. It's just some extended membrane-like object. Membrane is a two-brain, and then we have D-brains with D-dimension, so a string is a one-brain, uh, which is extended in space, maybe in some higher dimension. Now, uh, these uh, things are called D-brains, and we can certainly make these deep rays by considering a black hole and moving it up into the extra dimensions. Any black hole moved into flat dimensions is going to look like a brain. And because the various string theories that we're interested in live naturally in higher dimensions, or the supergravity theories, there is no doubt whatsoever, and it's, uh, it's vindicated by calculations, that uh, supergravity theories, which are the low energy limit of string theory, are replete with D brains. And if you choose D brains of this sort, they would replete with supersymmetric D brains. Now, how do these correspond to what happens in, in string theory? Well, it was realized by um, Holczynski, I guess, first and most dramatically, that uh, string theory contains fundamental strings, F strings, or F1 brains. And they can end, they can have boundary conditions in the open string theory for which these uh, strings define a locus on which they end, and that locus is what we call a D brain. Now, all of this is a microscopic picture of this procedure. And you can compute the microscopic properties of this picture by using the underlying string theory. 
You can compute the number of states with certain charges and so forth. Now, amongst the charges in string theory are these magic uh, central charges. And they correspond to charges in string theory called Ramon Ramon charges. It's known that uh, these charges were in principle true, but uh, Ramon Ramon fields don't couple in a straightforward way to, to strings. So uh, the final synthesis says that uh, extreme black holes of certain types should be looking like EPSD brains. So that offers um, the possibility of doing microscopic calculations which are more sophisticated than the one that I mentioned over here. Uh, the most famous one is due to Andy Stranger and Kumran Batha, but there are many more that follow. So what you do is you imagine a macroscopic D brain, which means a macroscopic black hole with some flat directions. And then you consider moving it towards a regime in which um, you're going to one um, which a good description is by these D brains. Because it's supersymmetric, various quantities, including the number of states, will remain constant as you do that. And therefore, you can get a handle on these macroscopic states. So there are going to be two ways of calculating the number of states. One is to count the entropy of your ma the area of your macroscopic object, and the other is to calculate the microstates. And indeed, they were able to verify using a formula of Cardi. That S does indeed equal. K log n in this situation. Now, all this is very fine because of supersymmetry. One of the main topics which I hope people will be discussing here and, and many people are actively trying to push is how can we move away from the um, supersymmetric state? That is the real challenge in this theory. Do we have reliable ways to compute non-perturbative effects in theories where you are a long way away from the supersymmetric situation. Now I said that if you're, uh, if you're uh, an ordinary black hole, your specific heat is negative. If you're a BPS black hole or near BPS, it's actually positive. In other words, near BPS systems behave like regular thermodynamic systems. It's still a big issue in this subject whether or not as there is a phase transition which separates this sort of behavior. Who knows? It, some people will have faith and some people will say, well, let's see if we can calculate it. Um, so that's one of the important questions um, that has arisen. Now, I don't think I'll say much about ADS um, and black holes except uh, the following. Um, because I'm running out of time, I just want to say a few words about De Sitter shortly. Um, in ADS, uh, the way to think about ADS is the following. Uh, the energy of a particle at rest in ADS is given by 1 minus lambda r squared over 3, say, times its mass. Now, if lambda is negative, uh, this energy grows with R. And basically, the way to think about living in ADS is that everybody su is susceptible to a simple harmonic motion. They never get all the way out to infinity. It's a box with invisible, we uh, invisible, um, excuse me, with invisible walls. Um, there is a wall at infinity. There is a conformal boundary, as it's called. And you can examine the theory at large uh, distances. Now, this is called the Tolman redshifting um, formula, roughly speaking, and it's telling you that energy scales vary with position in the radial direction of an ADS space. Now, what we do know from quantum field theory quite generally and statistical mechanics is the behavior of uh, quantum field theories vary with the energy scale that you're considering. 
So it's very natural to consider what would happen if you make the renormalization uh, scale direction a new coordinate. So in this theory, uh, or in, in this idea, we introduce an extra coordinate. We have a system where we put things in some sort of a box. We have a theory on the boundary, which is the most extreme we can get, the ultraviolet end of the renormalization group flow. And then in the interior, we're going towards the infrared. So this is the basis of um, the um, ADS-CFT correspondence. And as I said earlier, what you can do is think of this box in the same way that we thought earlier of a black hole in a box. If you do so, you try to find a black hole solution. It's very straightforward to do so, and you will see a phase transition. Now, in this scenario, this is telling you something about Yang-Mills and the deconfinement transition. Now, this is again a situation of holography. Because all of the information about this system, in principle, is contained in information on the boundary. So this is a four-dimensional quantum field theory in this case, which captures the details of a bulk theory of uh, five dimensions. So there you see again a link between um, black holes and, well, as I say, I don't like to use this word information because I don't really know what its definition is. I prefer to use technical terms like entropy, and then I like to be careful about whether it's Boltzmann's entropy, Gibbs's entropy, and so forth. But there is a very close uh, connection here which needs to be fleshed out. Now, finally, I want to talk about things which are actually happening in the real world. So I'll say a few words about the sitter space and, uh, and, and inflation. Because many of the issues which people will be discussing in this uh, program are really relevant to deep issues about how the universe evolved. So I said that basically living in ADS is like living in a world where everybody is attracted to, uh, towards the center with a harmonic attraction. Um, Living in the sitter space is the opposite. Everybody is repelled because lambda is now positive. Everybody is repelled, and so you're in a large repulsive force. And therefore, you are in a situation where you're turning inside out the situation that we had on this diagram. On this diagram, we had the situation where people were attracted into the black hole. In the sitter space, it's the inside-out picture. That you're sitting here, and if you go too far, you'll be swept inside uh, another horizon called a cosmological horizon. Now, um, the theory can be developed in an almost precisely analogous fashion at a formal level. First, you can start with the classical theory. And the classical theory tells you that the area of this cosmological horizon which surrounds us is non-decreasing. It's given by a formula which you can easily compute in the non-rotating case. Um, and, and in principle, there is entropy associated with it as well and a temperature. So again, you can get this picture. Uh, lambda has dimensions 1 over length squared. So uh, this is a length squared and then you divide by the Planck length squared that gives you the formula. And in fact the area is uh, 12 pi, so the, the 4 comes in. And the temperature is given by uh, some formula like this. So at the classic, uh, classical and semi-classical level, uh, the analogy is perfect. There's a second law and so forth. Um, and, and really, it's just that there's anti-gravity. I'll draw a picture of what the sitter space looks like because I want to draw out the analogy between what happens during inflation and what happens um, uh, in black holes. So let's take pure de Sitter. Pure de Sitter is a hyperboloid, so it's the surface 
you can think of two-dimensional to sit a space literally as a surface, like a cooling tower. And if you're at one position on it, you can think of yourself as having a world lying like this. And then, uh, because uh, this line, this null line, is asymptotic to this, this goes on forever, obviously, this is a horizon. This is a, what's sometimes called a causal horizon because the past of this world line is bounded by this null surface. And uh, if you're there, then you're going to lose information in the same way as a process by which information or particles can tunnel through here and this has a certain temperature. The temperature is uh, quite small if the cosmological constant is the big one that we see in the lab but it, nevertheless it's there. And so you have the same story about um, entangled states and so forth and how we, we see what's going on. Now I'd like to just finish by telling you um, what the relationship of this is to inflation, just to emphasize that the sort of issues that people uh, are wanting to understand uh, and, and, and get a handle on um, are closely related to the same issues that we have with black holes. And then I'll stop. So I'm going slightly over. I hope that's all right. Yeah. So let's consider theories of the universe before inflation. Theories of the universe before inflation look in pictorial terms rather like this. There's some expansion. Notice this curve is convex this way, so uh, it's a decelerating expansion. It was the last scattering surface. That's where the CMB comes from. And let's say we're here. So we look back on the CMB and we see various places on the CMB. And, uh, and uh, those places have the same temperature to high degree of precision, to one part in 10 to the 5. That's actually rather surprising in, according to old-fashioned views because this goes back a bit. Uh, and then we have a big bang. Now, you see, this guy has a past which goes across to there. This guy has a past which goes across to there. They were never in causal contact, according to this theory. So it's a puzzle why they should have the same temperature to one part in 10 to the fifth or so. This is uh, one of the standard um, reasons for believing in inflation. How does that work in inflation? Well, you have the same... Well, we, get, we start off with a picture like this. We go back to the last scattering surface. So we have the same set of observations here. What we actually know is that the cosmological constant eventually takes off because we've observed the cosmological constant. So the curvature of this thing is changing. And if you believed in internal inflation, it would go on forever. Okay, so now let's look at the past bit. Well, the past bit is that you replace this by a small de Sitter space. And then there's something else at the bottom here. For example, you may have a no boundary proposal or something. So um, now the end of inflation uh, is occurring somewhere like this. Uh, let me see, have I drawn this completely how I want to? Uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to draw that like that. And here is the quasi de Sitter state, state. And this is last scattering. There may or may not be a big bang, but in most models people try to do without that. But now the point is that um, the process that we're seeing, this is the horizon, or quasi-horizon, during inflation. This generates a lot of thermal radiation. We lose information here, and, uh, and we generate a, thermal, a set of thermal fluctuations. 
they go outside this horizon. But it's not really a horizon. They go past this now surface. But um, uh, because this curve does not continue in this way, there is no horizon in this model, unless we're talking about this horizon, which is a very much later horizon, if this accelerates exponentially forever. So eventually what happens is, of course, the things do this, uh, in, uh, radiation and interactions during reheating thermalize, and these two points, therefore, are naturally uh, having the same temperature because they have been in causal contact. Now the point I'm really making is that that's exactly the same as what I said earlier. If somebody starts throwing shells on top of a black hole or over you, you've no idea where the horizon is. But the process of uh, joining together, the process of seeing these fluctuations, which are now well, well verified by observation, is, is precisely uh, related to the problem of what's happening to the information inside <coughs> horizons and can it get out. So uh, that's all I really want to say. I just want to point out this has been a very interesting subject. It touches every area of physics you can think of. And every time it does, it brings to, uh, or brings from those areas of physics, really striking fundamental results. I'm sure it has a great future, and I'm sure it will have a great future in the next few months. Thank you for listening. of the charge originally. You see, you, we don't ever bother about charged black holes in the real world because pair production or even the flow of macroscopic currents is so efficient. You, only, you have to be in a theory where the objects you're talking about don't couple to the electromagnetic field. That's the magic of these central things. Um, so what you would expect to happen in the case you mentioned is that the charge is discharged before the final evaporation, so there should be no puzzle there. However, there is a puzzle, which our chairman knows a great deal about, which is that if there are global symmetries, uh, discrete symmetries, they cannot be conserved by the process, or at least it looks very tricky. This is the issue of remnants, because there's no information about the global symmetries of the, of the things inside. To put it in pictorial terms, imagine that you made a black hole out of particles which could be both red and green. So you made it out of only red particles. You would not know on the outside whether they were red or green. The thing will evaporate equally with respect to red and green, because that's by definition an exact symmetry of our theory. The outside doesn't know the difference. So in the end, you've got a large number of red particles or red charge inside, and you don't know where it will go. So there are two rough outcomes to that. Either uh, there are remnants in the world uh, in which you have dense systems with, with large global charges, or there's no such thing as a global charge. It's an anomaly in the theory. It's interesting that in string theory there are no global charges, and so this isn't a paradox. But in theories with global charges, it is a, a deep challenge to explain what's, what's going on. And there has been an extensive debate even since the 1980s about the nature of what those remnants might be. And there are related debates about whether or not, in some sense, information or entanglement is analogous to these discrete symmetries. Well, you can, you can try to do calculations in which uh, the black hole's parameters change slowly. Uh, if you do that classically, it's not a difficulty. It's well understood and you can do it numerically. If you're interested in the quantum field theory aspects of it, it's not so simple. You have to do some quantum field theory in a time-dependent background with time-dependent parameters. Some attempts have been made uh, to um, 
do mainly station time independent situations where you compute the energy momentum tensor in the vacuum state, it needs renormalization, but it's non-zero in general, and then couple it back to the geometry. And the overall picture you see is that the, energy, the renormalized energy momentum tensor doesn't satisfy the standard positive energy conditions. It's, it, it allows, in fact, the area to go down. It has to for consistency, and that's what's found. Indeed, in general, uh, expectation values for the energy momentum tensor of classical theories, which ought to be positive, just violate the energy conditions. So that's most of what we know with any degree of rigor or preci precision, at least most of what I know about the non-equilibrium situation. It is, of course, extremely challenging and interesting. Okay, let's thank you.